all you physics enthusiasts and lovers of physical experiments. One year ago, we created three videos with the overall title, The Paradox of the Bent Pipe. And these videos generated the liveliest and most heated discussion. During this spring, we have added an additional video to our collection. Now, we believe it is the appropriate moment to summarize, collect all the arguments, and present the material that was not created by us, but rather by our loyal subscribers. And at the conclusion of this video, we will showcase an experiment that we have not had the opportunity to conduct thus far. Something completely new. Just a reminder, here's what this paradox is all about. We're looking at water flowing through a pipe with a fancy shape. And a multitude of individuals hold the belief that the particles that enter the knee that is in the process of turning at the same time should also exit this knee at the same time. However, it would then be revealed that the particle, which is in motion along the inner loop, should decrease its speed during this movement as it needs to cover a shorter distance in order to maintain its trajectory. And that particle, moving along the outer edge, on the contrary, should increase its speed to cover a greater distance. And I declare and I will demonstrate that everything is occurring precisely in the opposite manner. The particle, which is in motion along the inner loop, will also experience an increase in its speed while traversing along this twisty track. And the one that goes along the outer bypass will also slow down, so the particle that went along the inner bypass will greatly surpass the one that went along the outer bypass. And my evidence is constructed in the following manner. Let us consider a water particle that is in motion along the central line of a curved section of the structure. Since this particle moves along the arc of a circle, it constantly changes the direction of its velocity. And that means that it is subject to a centrifugal force directed towards the center of the circle. However, the sole origin of the force exerted on a particle can solely be the disparity in pressure on each side of it. Therefore, it follows that the pressure exerted on the outer casing should be higher than the average pressure, while on the inner casing, it should be lower than the average pressure. Now let us consider two particles that move along the inner and outer periphery of the system. So this little particle, moving along the outer loop, enters an area of higher pressure and according to the law of conservation of energy, its speed got a decrease here. So she will go around with a slower speed. And that particle, which moves along the inner loop, enters an area of reduced pressure. And in accordance with the same law of conservation of energy, its speed is expected to increase, thus enabling it to pass through the inner loop with a higher speed. Now let's consider another misconception, which actually originates from the first one. Some individuals believe that the average current line, which divides the track in half at the entrance, will divide it in half once more at the turn. However, that statement is incorrect, and we will demonstrate its inaccuracy in the following way. Let's assume there's about half of the water next to the inner canal, and the other half is next to the outer one. Here they move at the same speed, well and accordingly through the same sections, which of course shouldn't be depicted like that, but I find it convenient to do it with these ellipses. Now observe, we have already demonstrated that the portion of the liquid that moves along the inner contour will possess a greater velocity. So, to let it through, you'll just need a smaller cross-section. Well, I'll just slap on this little arrow and a makeshift cross-section here. And that liquid, which is in motion along the outer contour, experiences a decrease in speed. Well, to slow down, you need to increase the cross-section. Well, and accordingly, I'll attach such a conditional section here. And that signifies that the line, which was running in the middle here, will be required to hug the inner contour. And then, when coming out, will once again divide the section in half into two equal parts. And of course, I got to emphasize that everything said so far applies to the model without vortex flow of an ideal, incompressible, non-viscous fluid. The calculations of the current in this model were performed by our subscriber, YTRV. 
and now we have the opportunity to analyze them in depth and derive valuable insights from the obtained results. And here we observe everything I was discussing. The velocity of the liquid on the inner contour is considerably greater than the velocity on the outer one. And the radii of the curves here are related as 1 to 3, well, and correspondingly the speeds are related as 3 to 1. The high pressure area is indicated in red and it is positioned on the outer rim, while the low pressure area is indicated in blue and it is positioned on the inner rim of the weather system. And you can also examine the center line closely and observe how it tightly follows the inner contour when navigating a turn. Well, now take a look. Our channel is still mostly dedicated to experimental physics, and my musings have been more of a qualitative theoretical nature for the time being. Well, naturally, it would be fantastic to proceed to the experiment at this point, but conducting an experiment on the flow of water through a pipe and measuring the velocity distribution is still a considerably challenging task. However, we have the option to utilize the analogy that exists between the movement of water through pipes and the movement of electric current. This analogy is based on the fact that the equation for the case of the flow of an ideal incompressible fluid, which we considered as water in our reasoning, and the equation for the electric current in a homogeneous medium, they have exactly the same form and structure, indicating a strong similarity between these two phenomena. Well, that is the reason why I prepared this foil track. Voltage will be supplied at this point, and electric current will flow along this track. We will observe how it is distributed within the track and analyze the results accordingly to gain insights into the flow of electric current. The setup as a whole appears like this. We utilize a source that emits small voltages. So right now it's set to one and a half volts but they have pretty big currents. And at this moment, there is a current of 39 amps flowing through the track. And when I place my hands on the track, I can feel the rapid heating up of the surface. If we had a thermal imager, we could examine the temperature distribution. However, we do not possess a thermal imager at present. I'll turn off the source for now and explain how we're going to proceed. So, we know the full current that flows through this circuit we are interested in the distribution of current density. However, we cannot try it on him directly at this moment. However, we are aware that the current density is directly proportional to the electric field, which, incidentally, we are unable to measure directly either. Nevertheless, we can make use of a probe equipped with two leads to apply it to the track and determine the voltage between these two points by observing the potential difference that exists. An electric field is the quotient obtained by dividing the voltage by the distance. And then we have current density, which we will evaluate by considering the magnitude of the voltage, measured in millivolts per meter, a commonly used metric in the field of electrical engineering. Now let's examine the current density distribution. First, let's ensure that the current is evenly distributed on the straight sections of the track for a comprehensive analysis. We apply 12 millivolts to the inner side, 12 millivolts to the middle, and 12 millivolts to the edge, all of them being the same voltage of 12 millivolts. Now let's have a look at what is currently happening on the bypass and see what's going on. On the edge of 7.8, 12, right in the middle of 11.7, practically the same 12, and now on the inner loop. way more than 12. So like you can state that it primarily attempts to follow the path within the circuitry. Well, it's obvious there's less distance there, so there's less resistance. And we were discussing this analogy between the flow of an inviscid and incompressible fluid and the distribution of electric current density in a homogeneous medium as far back as last year. However, throughout this period, we have acquired significant expertise in utilizing the VisiMag program for the purpose of modeling magnetic fields. 
And because the magnetic field in a homogeneous medium is described by the same equations as the distribution of electric current and the flow of an incompressible fluid, we have the ability to take and create a visual representation of the flow in Visimag and observe it directly with our own eyes. Let's take a regular magnet in the shape of a half-moon horseshoe. And let's attach a U-shaped magnetic core with high magnetic permeability to it. In this case, the magnetic field will be practically entirely concentrated inside the magnetic core. Let us take a look at the field in such a system, which is calculated using the Visimac program. And we see that on the turns of the inner loop, the power lines are closer together and the magnetic field is stronger than average, while on the outer loop, the power lines are more spread out and the magnetic field is weaker than average. And the power line, which on straight sections divided the flow into two equal halves, at the turn turned out to be shifted towards the inner bypass. And now it is logical to discuss once more the way in which the distribution of the magnetic field in a magnetic circuit, or the distribution of the electric current density in a conductor, is connected to the flow of an ideal incompressible viscous fluid. So here I have a total of two equations that are written down, and they describe all of these situations. In the first equation, the divergence of the velocity field is equal to zero. Well, to put it simply, it's the principle of continuity. How much do we have? The amount of liquid that enters the pipe at one section is equal to the amount that exits it. There are no sources inside. The second equation, the curl of the velocity field is equal to zero. And this equation provides us with the information that the flow is characterized by the absence of rotation or vorticity. However, if the liquid were somewhat viscous, this second equation would no longer hold true. There would be a need to write a more complex equation for the entry of toxins. And this is our subscriber with such a nickname. The boonies is the remote and rural area where they reside. Even in the past, approximately a year ago, during our discussion of this particular topic, I conducted some calculations in the program I had at that time, which takes into consideration the viscous flow of the liquid and obtain some visually interesting results that we are now about to examine. The initial image is created for the speed domain, and in this area, the fastest movements are depicted in blue, while the slowest ones are represented in red. And we see that coming out of the turn on the inner bypass, there is a characteristic vortex breakdown. Anyway, the same whirlwind of events happens at the entrance to the turn, but on the outside of the knee. And this picture is constructed for the pressure field. The yellow pressure here is the lowest. And the whirlwind's disruption around the corner is even more visible here. The whirlwinds are breaking off one after another and even merging. Inside each whirlwind, the pressure is really low. Sometimes even the color red is not enough for him. You can see the whirlwinds on the outer edge, but they're not as intense. And now, the hit of the season. The experiment that I had promised to conduct in the fourth video is finally here. And a straightforward setup was constructed specifically for him. Now that is precisely what I refer to as a genuine O-shaped knee. The air will enter into it through a straight tube. And he will be extracted out using a vacuum cleaner that is attached to this hose for suction. Well, the fact that there is such a turn here is no longer important because this turn is behind the knee. And it won't affect him at all and two little tubes are attached to the knee itself. There is one on the inside loop and another one on the outside. They are both very thin. And now let's move on to the rubber tubes. All this stuff is connected to this U-shaped pressure gauge that is going to measure the pressure difference between the two circuits when air begins to flow through the setup. According to our theory, the pressure on the inner surface should be lower while on the outer surface it should be higher. And that signifies that the column in the left knee of the U-shaped manometer should rise up, whereas in the right knee it should go down in order to indicate the pressure difference. Let's see what happens in reality. Turn on the vacuum cleaner. We gradually increase the pace and see that the numbers really went where I predicted.
At this point in time, the existing variance in height between the two of them measures 5 centimeters. This indicates that the pressure difference is 5 centimeters of water column or 500 pascals in terms of pressure units. At present, we have an understanding from both theory and direct experimentation that the pressure exerted on the inner surface is lower, while on the outer surface it is higher. However, what is the cause of this variation in pressure? I believe that you will be able to provide an answer to this question. Write your thoughts on this matter in the comments section of this YouTube video.